Hello, and welcome to the virtual Scandinavia House and today's book event celebrating the, the nominees from Denmark for the Nordic Council Literary Prize. Joining us today is Raquel Haslund Gerlund and Solvay Bala, and moderated by Tor Leifert. Unfortunately, Jesse Kleeman, the Greenlandic nominee, came down with the cold and is unable to join us today. Next week, we'll be speaking with one of the Finnish nominees, Kai Korka Aha on the 4th of October, and the Faroes nominee, Benny Bergson, on the 11th of October. This talk is being recorded and will be made available on our website, scandinavias.org, as well as our YouTube page. Feel free to ask questions in the Q&A section, and we'll get to them towards the end of the event. I will put, a, I, I will put instructions in the chat function for you. Tor Leifer is a radio presenter, anchor of the daily show Kulturen at the National Danish Broadcasting Corporation. Among other degrees, he holds an MA in musicology, film, and media studies, and is the author of 10 books of various fields. He is also a knight of the French Order de Arts et des Lettres. Excuse me, my French is terrible. Um, but please <laughs> welcome Tor. <laughs> please welcome Tor, who will introduce the authors. Thank you so much, Kyle, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about the Nordic uh, Prize first and the Scandinavian countries, um, because it's uh, it's uh, uh, a, a jubilee, you know, it's uh, 70 years ago, it was in 52, 1952, that the Nordic countries uh, agreed to cooperate uh, very closely. It was in the wake of the Second World War, and the, these countries formed the Nordic Council, and uh, you know, often you call us Scandinavia, but strictly speaking, Scandinavia is just Norway and Sweden and Denmark. So the Nordic Council and the whole idea of Nordic cooperation also includes Iceland and Finland and the Åland Islands in the Baltic and the Sami peoples in northern Norway and Sweden and Finland. And the Faroe Islands, as you will talk next week uh, or in two weeks with Benjer Bergson and Greenland the world's biggest island, which is much closer to the US and Canada than to Denmark, but somehow belongs by colonial uh, reasons um, to our language uh, area and political co cooperation area. But one of the goals of the Nordic Council is to, to really make Scandinavia and the Nordic, Nordic countries, they, they aim to make it the most closely cooperating, most sustainable region and most integrated region in the world. So to celebrate its 10 years uh, in 1962, the Nordic Council uh, made this literary prize. And that is also, you know, it's uh, an anniversary. It's exactly 60 years ago. Um, and we will know uh, on November 1st in Helsinki, Finland, which author will win this year's prize. We have here the two Danish nominees. We will shortly present Jesse Kleeman from Greenland, who came down with the, the cold and the flu. But uh, we'll start with a reading by Rakel Heslon Geil and uh, Solvay Berle. And first, Rakel, I would uh, just say a few words about your novel, uh, Adam and Paradise, because uh, just a few notes first. Uh, mm -hmm. It's Rachel's third book. She's written a collection of short stories and another novel, uh, all very different one of, from um, another. And uh, this one demonstrates, as the Nordic Council puts it, that apparently Rachel can write anything she decides to. <laughs> so first we need to know that uh, the main character, the protagonist, is a Danish painter, Christian Saatman. He was born in 1843 died 1917. He was one un uncontestably one of Denmark's greatest painters. He often painted um, historical and biblical motifs uh, in strong, almost gaudy colors. Um, mm. But also the most delicate paintings, as a favorite painting of mine, is the one where he paints his, uh, uh, his luncheon table for one person in Portofino in, uh, in Italy. So a table set for one, uh, mm. which is maybe also, you know, telling about uh, his um, solitude in, in, in a way. Uh, he spent 17 summers in Italy, often with friends and colleagues and the students. He was very instrumental in creating a new um, artistic environment in uh, Copenhagen. 
new uh, new schools of painting, free schools of painting, and a free exhibition space, uh, you know, outside of the academy and uh, the salon. Um, and one of his great paintings is Adam in Paradise from 1913, uh, four years before his death. And Adam is young, he's beautiful, he's muscular, and he's stark naked. Mm. Um, and this painting actually played an important role in the large exhibition of Sartman's works uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, an exhibition with the aim, the explicit aim of queering uh, the painter and his art, um, showing his works in a, in a queer light. Mm. So knowing this, I think we should hear the, the very beginning of your novel, Rake. Yeah. So the novel looks like this. And one last important fact before I read the first, very first page of the novel is that uh, this is in the year of 1913. So Sadman, the great artist called the master by his friends, he's 70 years old and there's not that many years left before he will die. And there's just half a year or a little bit more than half a year uh, before the great war will start in Europe. Uh, so this is the, <laughs> the, the, the wonderful summer before everything has to, to, to break loose, before hills go, go on or before the great, um, yeah. Uh, so this is in July, 1913 in the Villa of Sartman and he's creating the paradise before uh, Adam, the model, uh, a soldier he found will come and visit. So, the workmen from the botanical garden are carrying each their tree. They part their carriage 30 meters from Casa Dantino on the corner of Mariendalesvei and Drosselvei. The tallest of the palms, my beautiful Kentia, had to be bent ever so carefully so that it strained against the carriage roof in order to fit. Now, unfurled in the light of the evening light, it is magnificent. I imagine my neighbors, Elsa and Harald Molpe, on their sofa with their evening tea and sponge cake, and Count Howell as he reaches for his reading, reading glasses, casting a glance out of his window to see a jungle marching past. You look like Egyptian fan bearers with the palm leaves swaying above your heads in that way, I tell the workmen who, with great caution, because I have told them to take care of the pants as were they newborn babes or Chinese porcelain are carrying my paradise palms. First Kensha, and behind him the phoenix palm and the dragon tree whose knife leaves flicks its shadows across the walls and windows of the house. That's right, this way, mind the doorway, they mustn't snap what a tragedy that would be, I say, stepping aside to let them into the villa. The turquoise front door is open, and in front of my window, still gaping after the afternoon onslaught of summer heat, bloom peonies of every color, crimson cone flowers, and purple pansies. The doors to the back garden and the sun cradle, my south-facing terrace brimming with flower pots and red flower currant, are flung wide open too, so that the south, so that July, hefty and fragrant with every scent, can march through the house and breathe body into the silky curtains, so they dance and whirl up the dust that Mrs. Hesselund has left in the corners. That's right, in here through the parlor and into my studio, I sing to my muscular angel giants as they lift the palms across the threshold. We are creating paradise, my good sirs. The tree of knowledge will be a lemon tree, I've decided. It's extraordinarily beautiful with fruits as big as fist clasping the sun. Once the angels have left, I sit down to assess the scenery. My spacious studio, once so bright, has been transformed into a dim greenish grotto, bursting with an entirely strange palette of scents. The bananas are especially pungent. I bought them fully ripe to get them on the very yellowest of the banana scale, because when so much of the painting will be green, the bananas must radiate a yellow so ripe it cannot be more yellow. One should smell the color quivering on the edge, about to plunge into brown. 
And then I will just read a few lines in Danish so you can hear that uh, the Danish rhythm of the, of the text. Um, and it's just the very last part uh, when the, the giant angels have, have, uh, <laughs> have lived again. Da flytte englene er gået, sætter jeg mig ned for at vurdere sceneriet. Mit store atelier, som før var så lyst, er nu blevet en dunkel og grønlig grotte, fyldt med en helt fremmed duftpalet. Især bananerne lugter kraftigt. Jeg købte dem fuldmodende for at få den, netop som deres kulør er den gulest mulige på skalaen over banankulør. For når så meget andet bliver grønt på maleriet, skal bananerne lyse en gul, der er så moden, at den ikke kan blive mere gul. Man skal kunne dufte på farven, at den skælver på kanten, netop inden den styrter sig ned i det brune. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very beautiful, Rakel. Um, maybe just, you, you, you mentioned the summer of 1913. Mm. Um, a couple of years ago, there was this uh, brilliant German writer writing a whole book called 1913, Florian Ilias. Yeah. You know, the last year, Europe's last year before the war, before everything mm -hmm. plunges into brown, if I may yeah, say yes. so. Uh, so uh, uh, it's, it's, it's Europe's last summer. It's Sartman's mm -hmm. last great summer. blossoming, last mm -hmm. great summer. Could you mm -hmm. talk a little bit more about that? Mm. You know the, the 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 final bloom before. Mm. Mm. Yeah, actually, Sandman was a great artist and an interesting artist. But it was more his painting, Adam in Par uh, Adam in Paradise. But it also have another title called Adam Bored in the Garden of Paradise uh, that caught my interest because I. I think when you write historical novels, especially if it's like sort of biographies, um, if it's a novel, then it's not, well, one thing is, is that it's a biography of a person about, you know, the historical facts and of so and so, but it's also about catching a life, a person that somehow transcend his normal life and become a symbol. And for me, that, you know, one of this, the, this great European artist living right there in this great summer. And then of all the motives that he could have chosen in this world, he makes Adam in Paradise, which is maybe our culture's first great uh, artist myth. I mean, uh, uh, the, the, the myth of paradise, uh, the creation of paradise and the fall of paradise is of course a, a such a great myth that you can use it for a lot of things. But one thing is that it's actually a myth of creation because God is alone in, in his, you know, in the darkness. And then somehow the loneliness is so oppressing on God himself that he decides to create. And then he creates this wonderful world and he creates a man in his, to his own liking, but adds a tree in order so that the man can take an active choice maybe to be or not to be in, uh, in, in paradise and that is such a great framework for creating a, a you know a, an artist portrait you have the artist who controls everything this is the man who has you know the the danish king was an, almost going to knock on his door to uh, to bring his uh, greetings to Simon when he had his birthday he has like he has won everything um, the the admiration of his peers the money and everything and then he sort of locks himself into his own villa to create the, this dense sphere and he can control the model mm. and somehow you know he makes the, the model into his own liking and then i think what i found interesting was that here you have a great sort of passive scene the artist looking and then there's something that breaks through the the model not this model but other men in the time do an opera or or sort of um, um challenge the 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 control of the artist but still it's this great scene of looking and creating I've, yeah mm. yeah yeah and and funnily enough you know i'm i'm not a theologian and and i'm not mm. you know but god 
must have known what he did when he planted that tree. But anyway, he uh, uh, this is also, you know, that Garden of Paradise also descends into chaos in some yeah. way, yeah. just like Europe does in 1914, etc. So it's, it's really, really interesting. Um, mm. We'll talk a lot more and we'll hear Solva read in two minutes. I would just like you, I mean, we should have had Jesse, uh, Jesse Kleeman with us, mm. uh, who is not only a poet, but a performance artist as well. And it would have been very great to see her um, perform her poetry uh, here. Um, Jesse Kleeman was born in uh, Upernavik in the, in the northwestern Greenland, very far away. She's a poet, an actress, a visual artist, a performance artist, and one of the most important Greenlandic um, writers and poets. And um, I have her new poems uh, here. Uh, I wonder if you can see them, but it's it's called mm. Arcticos Doloros, uh, mm. which is, of course, it's a bit like Harry Potter, or something like, like that, like magical formula, because, mm. I mean, uh, it's neither Greek nor Latin. It's a newfound language, but we can understand somehow uh, that it means Arctic pain. Um, and there are not only poems to be read aloud, but also, you know, to be to be read on the on the page on the on the white page because they they form um, they sort of form um, uh, you know they, they form uh, little uh, sculptures on the page and they mix English and uh, Greenlandic and Danish. Uh, so it's really interesting. She started out as an actress in the Tukak uh, Theater, and whether in her performances or her poetry, the body and uh, the bodily experience are very important. And uh, uh, there's pain because, you know, Arctic pain and vulnerability, but also strength and power and uh, a lot of humor as well. Uh, but it's uh, it's partly a post-colonial uh, experience of repression and modernity and globalization. It's also a lament, you could say, uh, over the destruction of nature and the climate and the Arctic. And there's also, in a way, a modern interpretation of the old Inuit myths about the sea and, and this great mythical creature, the mythical mother of the sea. Um, who takes care of uh, humanity uh, and um, yeah, so very beautiful poems. Um, and uh, we will move on to, uh, to Solvay Belle, who has written a great number of books since her debut in 1986. Her highly praised uh, novel, uh, According to the Law, has been translated into a dozen languages uh, not only English, but uh, Swedish, Norwegian, Spanish, German, Dutch, uh, French, uh, you know, every, every <laughs> not every language imaginable, but a dozen languages. Um, and for several decades, Solvay has been working on a large scale, seven volume work, extracts on calculation of volume. Uh, three of them are out now, uh, but four more are to follow um, and it's uh, actually it's, it's all three combined that have been nominated for the Nordic Prize mm -hmm. and uh, they're sold for publication in Norway, the Netherlands, Sweden, Germany, uh, Serbia and North Macedonia. So really on their way out in the world. Um, one thing we should know before listening is that the protagonist Tara Selter is a young woman, an antiquarian bookseller who is trapped in time. Uh, she's stuck on November 18th, doomed to relive that day again and again and again. And of course, I haven't read further than volume three, but when that ends, she's been through 1,892 different November 18ths. <laughs> so, uh, Sulva, which day are you reading to us? That, that is day, it's actually, uh, it's actually uh, day 122, but it's, uh, it's actually, she's, she's looking back to the, the second 18th of November when she realizes that it is 
so to speak, Groundhog Day. No, but I mean that she realizes that the day has repeated itself. Mm. Um, so, but that is, she's actually sitting in the the uh, in the guest room of her house and uh, and is now looking back on the other days, on what has happened. So, so she's been there 122 days now. And uh, I should just say that when she's when she's uh, thinking back on on this this day, she's actually um, she has been. I mean, on on her on her November seventeenth, she's been uh, she's been in. Um, she, I mean, she's a uh, she's an antiquarian bookseller, but she's been at an auction in Bordeaux in France. She's, she actually lives in northern France. Uh, in a small town called the Clairon sous bois which doesn't exist, but it does here. Um, and uh, and she's gone to, uh, she's been at Bordeaux, she's bought some books, she's gone to Paris and uh, has woken up on the uh, 18th of November, the first 18th of November, which was totally normal. And uh, she's been, you know, visiting some other, some colleagues and she's been visiting a friend. And uh, it has been a very kind of, you know, nothing has happened on that day. Uh, she has been, uh, you know, sitting in a in a shop with that one of her friends owns, and uh, and she's burned her hand on a gas heater, mm -hmm. and uh, she's gone back to her hotel, uh, got some ice cubes for the hand, and we meet her the next morning. It struck me at breakfast. I had woken up in my room at the Hotel du Lisson shortly before half past seven with a damp towel beside me and a burn that no longer hurt very much. I had a quick shower and went down for breakfast. I ordered coffee, got myself something from the buffet and took this and the newspaper back to my table. But a quick scan of the front page was enough to tell me that it was the same edition as I had read the day before. When I went out to reception and asked for that morning's paper, I was told that the one I had in my hand was that morning's newspaper, that it was the 18th of November and that the day before had been the 17th. Even when I know I'm right, I seldom bother to debate such points. So I picked up another of the previous day's papers, returned to my table and drank the rest of my coffee. It was only when one of the hotel's other guests dropped a piece of bread on the floor that I began to worry. Not because I don't know that this sort of thing happens again and again in hotels all over the world, but because that the same guest had also dropped a piece of bread at that same spot the day before. It was a slice of white bread, uh, the same size as the one he had dropped the day before, and its fall occurred at the same speed. Gently drifting, a gently drifting descent, slow enough to show that this was a fairly light piece of bread. The hotel guest's actions were also identical. There was the same hesitation when he bent down for the bread and seemed unable to decide what to do with it once he'd picked it up off the floor. He was clearly torn between two codes of conduct, one which said you don't throw away good food and another uh, which said that food which falls from society's platters, baskets and plates are to be regarded as rubbish. Now I observed the same discreet movement as on the previous day when, after a glance around the room, he decided to slip the bread into a waste bin and take a croissant instead. The moment I saw this hesitant action, I knew that I was witnessing a rerun. I didn't know that there would be yet another 18th of, of November the next day and then another and another, but I knew that something was wrong. I immediately went out to check the date on the papers at the nearest newsstand, then to a cash point where I made a withdrawal on my credit card. And shortly afterwards, I called in at two different hotels to take a look at the calendar in reception. Not because I was in any doubt, but solely because I had to do something to handle my confusion. The dates on the newspapers, on my cash point receipt and on the hotel calendars confirmed that it was indeed the 18th of November. The weather too was the same. It had rained while I was having breakfast, but the sky had now cleared and I walked around the wet streets and saw the first shops opening up. 
it was going to be a cool day with some cloud and occasional sunny spells. And you will read a little bit in Danish too? Yes, I will yes. read a little bit in Danish. I should just say that uh, the translation is by Barbara Haviland. Uh, and then I will read a tiny bit. I will just have the last few lines like Rachel did. I det øjeblik, jeg så denne tøvende gestus, vidste jeg, at jeg befandt mig i en gentagelse. Jeg vidste ikke, at der ville komme endnu en 18. november dagen efter, og derefter endnu en og endnu en, men jeg vidste, at noget var galt. Mm. So. Rachel, we forgot to mention your uh, translator. Yes. Uh, It's two persons, Jennifer Russell and Sophia Hassi-Smith, who have done a very oh. wonderful job of translating. Rachel, uh, no, Solvay, um, you write somewhere in your novel that time has broken, and uh, I'm not the only one who has been reminded of, uh, of Hamlet, uh, Shakespeare's Hamlet, who famously says that the time is out of joint, Mm. Um, you got this idea many, many, many years ago, I think. Uh, do you remember uh, how it took form? Yeah, it was a bit weird, actually. <laughs> um, and I, I, I mean, of course it was, I mean, one has a, a lot of different ideas, so it wasn't really that special in that. Uh, I mean, I just had, I mean, of course there was, there wasn't a Groundhog Day film yet, but there was, there was of course, um, you know, stories about time loops and stuff. And I, I, I know I've read some of them. And, and, uh, and then I just had, I think I was also somehow thinking about uh, uh, novels. I was, I was rather interested in novels that took place in, in one day. And, and um, so, so there was something about, you know, I, I mean, I might have had Bloomsday in, in my mind as well, but... Mm. but uh, or, or Mrs. Dalloway. Uh, and, uh, and, and quite a few others, maybe. Yeah. I hadn't read Mrs. Dalloway, but I had, I, um, I, I was, I had been in, a, in a bookstore in Paris called Shakespeare and Company, where I had um, lived for quite a while, actually, and, and everybody had apparently read uh, Ulysses there, so I thought that was just something <laughs> apparently. I had to do that, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, um, but on, I mean, I just remember this, getting this idea, and then and I remember having, having my alarm clock and dropping it on the floor, and then it stopped. And, and so I, I remember this, this feeling, oh, I probably have to think a little bit more about this idea. Mm. So, but it took a lot, of, a lot of time before it actually materialized. Uh, so I, I think, I mean, that was in 87, in mm -hmm. fact. So that's a few years ago. <laughs> yeah, 35 years ago. And yeah, when, did you, like when did you know it could be, uh, that it should be seven volumes? How do you decide that? Oh, that was much, much, much later. I mean, yeah. that was when I just thought it was kind of, I mean, one book somehow. And um, and then I slowly realized, oh, no, it, this is going to be too big for this, because suddenly she grew older and older. Uh, and um, But also, uh, I mean, I think that was somewhere on the way I realized that it wasn't just going to be like two volumes or something, because, I mean, it, it somehow, it seemed to be different parts. I mean, they, they it, I don't know, it kind of grew into different books. And then I realized, oh, it's probably seven or something. So I just had to go with it. <laughs> and, uh, and there were some, so also some practical problems with having, you know, doing the whole thing at the same time. So, so it had to be seven. Yeah. <laughs> so. um, and I was really, um... How do you say? I, I was a bit apprehensive when embarking on the first volume, and I thought, well, how boring can this be, or how exciting can this be? <laughs> I didn't expect to it to be a page turner, which it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really couldn't stop. I just had to turn page mm -hmm. after page. It's really in a bit. It's like a thriller. So, mm -hmm. how did you, uh, how do you create that motor or that pulse or that sense of suspense? I don't know. I, I, I didn't 
<laughs> I, I didn't think it was a page turner at all. I mean, I don't, I still don't think so. <laughs> I mean, but uh, there's a lot of people who've said that, and I, I really don't know because I mean, mm. what, what is it? I mean, that's that's mm. that's too weird. I think. Yeah. So, Fakel, uh, 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 how do you? Yeah. I think I have a, a one thing uh, which could be an explanation for why you just keep turning the, the pages about Tara Seltzer, um, so wise book, because I, I've been reading a lot of like ex exhibition books, uh, like people who went to the, uh, through the poles, North Poles or South Poles or Greenland and got lost in the ice. And, and then you have these wonderful descriptions from people who have no other contact with other people. And they're just writing about the days in the snow one day after another that looks like and you lose sense of time and it's thrilling it's a thrilling re read because you go to the very innermost part of what it is to be a human when you suddenly take them out of society when you're not belonging to that re uh, like um, rituals and uh, uh, and all the things that we do that reproduce our days actually our every day is a it's a repetition in somehow, you know, we go to work, we, we get up, we brush our teeth and so on. And then you have this person by putting her into a day that keeps repeating, then she falls out of time and, 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 and questions, how do you actually live as a human? What, what is that to, to life when you don't have the purpose of society? And that's just really, really you know, one of the core questions of life. Uh, so that's <laughs> that makes it and then just to work out the parts of how this, this happened that's just exciting in itself <laughs> uh, hmm. do you recognize that uh, Solvay? she's on an yes, expedition maybe, I mean, a lonely expedition yeah but i think i actually think uh, i mean not all my books but all my kind of traditional fic I mean, fictions in a way, because I've, I've written some short prose that's rather different. But I mean, all my all my fictions in a way are uh, people who are lost somewhere. Um, the uh, I mean, my first novel was a woman on an unha uninhabited island. So so, you know, I was already there. So, yeah, I mean, that, I can I can recognize that. But uh, but I think it's only the first book that is so kind of uh, uh, what do you say, Robinson like? Mm. Um, so she has to. I, I don't think I would. Uh, I I actually it was quite a relief when another person sh showed up in the mm. novel. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, uh, and, and 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 we maybe shouldn't um, s make a plot spoiler, but but she will not. Oh, oh, uh, for Svend Lund, yeah. the sound is yeah. yes. Yeah. But then I can just add, you know, Robinson yeah. Crusoe wouldn't have worked if not Friday had turned up. Uh, that's also mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so uh, Rachel, to get back to you, um, that um, great exhibition a couple of years ago um, mm -hmm. explicitly talked about queering mm -hmm. uh, Sartman, uh, but. Mm -hmm. Uh, when it comes to it, we, we don't know that much about mm. his uh, emotional life, his uh, sexual orientation, mm. um, as we might say today. But mm. in your novel, you actually include source material from from the time, from uh, police interrogations, uh, newspaper articles, uh, mm. uh, a rather harsh debate um, taking place around mm. 1905, uh, 1906. There mm. was a great crackdown in Copenhagen on mm. male homosexual uh, encounters. Mm. So uh, this choice of uh, including actual source material from mm. the period, um, mm. could you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Um, so if I decided to create a novel about paradise and about, you know, everything that is just beauty, and then you have this intense gaze of the artist. And then I started to work with what was the things that were that might have been kept out of paradise uh, in order to create this. The book continues almost throughout the novel to be in this sort of intense gaze, creational, the, the, the thrill of creating. 
but they, there is a great sense of longing underneath. And in order both for the reader who don't know about the, the laws against homosexuality at the time, and also that this is actually just the time where in Denmark we start the debate thinking in a new way about homosexuality as a sort of identity and not as a as a not as just another perversion, but as something that you can uh, that can that can be a part of what you're born with. Um, that debate comes right in there. Uh, but this character, this great master, he paints, he, he's not a part of that discussion, but he paints with longing. And in order to make the reader understand that there is something which is kept out of paradise, that there is something that enlivens all of these flowers and all of this flourishing, in that, that there is something that cannot take place <laughs> in any mm. other way than in a symbolic way, then I had to add the discussion of the time yeah. as, uh, as uh, harsh documents uh, 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 gossiping about this artist and um, uh, articles, you know, where you have all the police, you have the, the judges, you have the, the, the newspapers of the time uh, in quite harsh language, discussing what is a homosexual and then yeah. you have the other part of this great artist painting eros like he's painting with the creation and with longing and with intensity and there is you in one say there is a intense gaze on the male body to call it homosexual as all the newspapers and the, and the discussion of the time, which is trying to pinpoint what it is to be a homosexual, and also trying to say that this is a degenerate, generation, degenerate mm. way of being, yeah. then that work doesn't fit on the view of the of the artist. But still, there is this intense, um, uh, maybe a sense of sublimation, you could say so, but it is created into a wonderful, uh, wonderful, um, into wonderful beauty. Uh, yeah. And this beauty maybe gains it strange from an intense sort of longing. longing that but cannot be fulfilled. That cannot be fulfilled, but still it's not just a sad tragic story. It's also about another way of looking at eros, of uh, the erotic uh, longing. If you had uh, one of the one of the most important paintings for me uh, when working with this novel was one of the paintings that Sardinman created from um, from so uh, from Platon's work, Platon's work, uh, the Symposium, which is you know the Western culture's greatest work about what eros is, and it's and he says that it's. Eos is born of both. It's not a god. It's not perfect. It's both of both longing. It's both of a sense of being poor and longing to fulfillment. So it's a it's a longing mm. that, and that longing brings you not only to love beautiful bodies, but also to to long for knowledge, to long for beauty and goodness. So this double picture of the erotic longing, both as a longing for another body, and in this case, a male body. But also, um, uh, but also the the striving for creating knowledge and beauty. Yeah. So yeah. that's the yeah. that's that's the two view of, of of sexuality that sort of quivers, and and they are not they are like uh, they they are two opposites, and that they are opposite in the novel as well. Yeah, and, th and that's one of the things that works so well in the, in the novel, I think. Mm. that you have this contrast that also mm. goes i mean it's it's very uh, i mean this that you you have to span very far in a way mm. uh, when you're reading it because you have to activate uh, you know a lot of aspects of your way of looking at mm. at mm. you know at at the, at the time as well but also at painting at creation and mm. at Sartman himself so there's mm. it, it he grows when you make the, when you when you make the the picture so so uh, so diverse in a way, I think mm -hmm. that that works really well in the novel. Yeah. And uh, uh, the listeners should uh, uh, maybe search uh, Zatman's name with a Z 
uh, and and the painting is called Plato and Socrates, isn't it? Uh, uh, the, uh, it's the, called uh, no, it's called uh, uh, Socrates and Alcibiades. Uh, yeah, and Alcibiades. Alcibiades. Yes, yeah, Alcibiades. that's right. Uh, and uh, and the other one, of course, is uh, Adam in Paradise or yeah. Adam bored <laughs> in Paradise. But mm -hmm. but just try to look at the paintings; that would be very nice. Mm -hmm. um, Solvay, um, one interesting aspect of your novel is also, well, Rachel talked a little about it before, it's about the relationship between uh, the between us humans and the world, um, uh, not only us and other humans, but also the world we inhabit. And uh, Tara is very conscious of the fact that as she relives November 18th again and again, uh, she leaves traces on the world and she consumes the world. She, she uh, devours it. She, she eats it. Uh, for instance, um, she has to choose a new supermarket all the time because her favorite food is very soon depleted. Uh, she can't get her favorite buns or her favorite uh, apricots or something because, uh, uh, because it's the same uh, November 18th and there won't come any new supplies so she has to choose another shop uh, so in a way uh, well she says she's a monster hunting she's a monster in action uh, the trail of blood of a predator so in a way there's also maybe uh, you uh, you talk in a way about ecology about mm -hmm. the climate about our our way of devouring the world we live in Yes, also because I mean the the thing is if 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 it's only one day and especially if it's November, um, I mean she can't really grow anything. So so and she's very I mean she's very occupied by by gardens and things and growing because they live outside. She and her husband Thomas live, uh, you know, they have a small garden that they've inherited from his granddad and stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, and when um, when she goes out and picks a leek out in the garden, it disappears because she eats it. <laughs> so 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 that means that basically she's in a. a She's in a finite container in a way. So she, I mean, she actually eats her uh, limited resources. So, so in a way, she is, she is stuck with the. I mean, uh, in a way, like we are on the planet, stuck with limited resources, and uh, and she realizes that quite early. Mm. And of course, when other people come up, then they will eat the world too. So she feels that she is some kind of 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 monster that mm. uh, that um, so so in a way i mean of course it is it is a weird story but it's also about us no doubt <laughs> <laughs> and um let's talk a little bit about writing because uh, uh as november 18th repeats itself uh, again and again to cope with it uh, she begins to write notes to herself she writes a diary and she writes because paper remembers, she said, paper mm. remembers, maybe there's something healing about sentences. Mm. So what is so healing about sentences and, and writing, Sulvai? Yeah, I don't know. I should ask her, but yes. uh, yeah, because I'm not sure about that. But she, I mean, I think her experience is, of course, you know, everybody else but they, everybody else don't remember what, mm. I mean, so, so she experiences, you know, especially with her husband, I mean, he, every morning, he has forgotten what, that, what they did the day before. So, mm. and she remembers one day after the other, and every morning she has to tell him about what has mm. happened, and now it's 87 days and so on. So that And then, then, she, then she stops, uh, then she isolates herself because it's yeah. too uh, confusing for him mm she coming all the time and saying but don't you remember it was november 18th yesterday so to in order not to make him un unhappy in a way yeah. uh, or confused she yeah. she isolates uh, yeah, she herself. goes into the guest room you know yeah. it's almost corona like but yeah. but um, but she uh, but this also i mean so this feeling that you know whatever she has been through and whatever she remembers she's all on her own with mm. everything because she doesn't share it with anyone. Yeah. And uh, and of course, you know, the paper, when she writes down things on the paper, she realizes that 
you know, if she keeps the paper uh, close to her, at least she can actually she can actually somehow get things to stay, and that means that the paper remembers her days. So when she tells the tells the paper something, then it is actually there the next day, and that's the only so that's the only place uh, there is a recording of her experiences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and of course, uh, we can't know exactly what Tara thinks uh, about it other than what she writes to us. But, mm -hmm. but as a writer, putting words on paper all the time, doing that as your occupation, uh, Rachel, uh, uh, my days are in my heap of paper. They have not been lost in oblivion. Paper mm -hmm. is my re remembering material. It feels as though someone is listening, she yeah. says. And when you write, for instance, uh, Rake, yeah. um, do you feel that someone is, is listening? I was actually just thinking when you when you two were talking right now that when I read Solwai's book, uh, uh, I was thinking about how can how can Solwai write? You have one person, and of course the room is expanding, but one day, and then this complete sense of non-belonging, of being a stranger suddenly in your everyday, just continues and continues. And there's so wonderfully um, precise descriptions of suddenly being a stranger to one's ordinary world. And that's, that sense is exactly what I think one of, the, one of the tasks that literature can do. That when you write, of course, writing is somehow a sense of writing or coming to understand the world but it's also one thing that especially if speculative fiction can do is that it takes the ordinary world that we know apart you sort of as a writer you get into one room or one thinking or one metaphor metaphor and then you continue to open it and you open it and you open it until it becomes a completely new world for you so there is also a sense of looking at the world and you when writing and it is this double sense of literature that is that is so strong, I think so. And that it seems as if for me that so why that you're doing this experiment when writing, that you're opening and opening and opening one day, making it more and more strange. Uh, so as that Tara is writing down to remember, you as an author is mm, re sense, you're making a sense the world again, you know, the rhythms again, because Tara cannot know them anymore, or she cannot get into it. Mm. Um, um, at least, and, and, and if you're asking for my, like, my exp uh, experience with that, I, when I decided to write a novel about a paradise, and a great master on the top of his career, uh, I had one great problem, which was that there was no conflict. Mm. Most literature has has to have some sort of plot or conflict, and this is just you know paradise is before sin, it's before conflict, it's before anything. But but being in that room again and again and again and creating this sense of paradise was an a way to to open up language. You ha I had to use half a page in order just to describe bananas and how they smell, and that's also another way of getting into the world again. <laughs> Uh, yeah. of sensing how is it actually this color is mm. yes but also this feeling that you know you have this paradise but then in your paradise there is this distance and I think that's actually a similarity between our books because mm. I mean they are very different but there's some things you know there's this strange these these distances opening up between, I mean, there's a huge dist distance between mm. Adam and Sadman, for instance, but there's also other distances. I mean, the, the his housekeeper, for instance, you can see this, the, the, this, mm. um, the balance between longing and distance mm. uh, in the middle of that paradise. And that is also one of the things that, uh, that you open up with making that paradise room, so to speak, that, you know, this, uh, uh, nearness and sensing and then the distance I think that's uh, that's one of the things that is um, so clear in your book too I think yeah, and then, and the, I think, yeah sorry no it's oh. just to say that when you want to make a, a sort of a, a book about an, an arts I think I thought the main thing that it must be about is about looking 
Mm. And looking is sort of, it is always a distance. And, and, and I wanted to make the eyes something that could touch the world, but not, but not the fingers, not the body, not his body touching another body, but the eyes as something that can touch. And then there's also, even though you can look so intensely on people and almost touch, then there's, yeah. Uh, and that's sort of a sadness of, of beauty in itself, that beauty is carried there is some sort of, there is a sadness to beauty, the sense of beauty, that it's something that you see, mm. but do you actually get into it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because it's also, yeah. I mean, seeing is a very distant sense in a way. So, so you, you, you have that feeling of, mm. of a, a very, of, of, of actually sensing very clearly, but with a very distant, mm. Um, mm. I mean, there's a, there's, so in a way, you don't need that kind of conflict because mm. it is in your material. That's what, what I kind of thought on the way that, you know, conflict is is there. I mean, of, of course, you have some conflicts in a way or some discussions um, between all the, uh, the, uh, the, the artists now and then. But I mean, you know, your, your conflict material is in the whole... I mean, in the, in the setup from the beginning, it's just a very quiet conflict. Mm. Yeah, and and as you say, there are conflicts with with his pupil, mm. some pupils of that course. don't fulfill his expectations, yeah. uh, yeah. other pupils uh, dying of um, tuberculosis or other diseases. Yeah. You know, there, there there there's a lot of things going on. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. The, I think the great conflict is I think it's Simone Weil, this uh, French. French. Jewish uh, philosopher who yeah. says that the great sorrow of human is, of human life is that to eat and to look and to eat is two different operations. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that that yeah, yeah. And it's interesting talking about the similarities because uh, there's a lot of looking in in your book, uh, Rachel, uh, and uh, there's uh, descriptions of color. For instance, beautiful descriptions of color, and Solva in your book, uh, the auditive sense, mm -hmm. hearing is very, very important. Also, I guess because of the distance, because Tara is isolated in mm -hmm. the spare room, but she hears uh, the 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 house's uh, secret life in a way, and she hears mm -hmm. her husband. She hears the kettle boiling, his steps on the staircase. Uh, the the tap running uh, a, 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 a staircase a, a squeaking uh, um, almost a leaf falling a leaf falling in the garden there's so much hearing going on in your novel and I as a radio person I'm <laughs> very excited about all this um, all these descriptions of uh, of the auditive sense yeah but, but but please do say something i said a lot but uh, <laughs> but uh, why why is the the hearing so important in, in your novel um yeah well, i think i think hearing changes along the novel in a way but also the uh, i mean you know this idea that what what writing can do also changes i've just realized that in book four but uh, <laughs> so I'm, just, I'm just about to finish it but but it changes very much but but uh, but it but the hearing also changes from something that is very satisfying for her in a way she feels very very close to her husband when she hears him much closer than uh, being together because all these days have come between them so in a way these days don't exist between them when when she's listening to him but then later on when she comes back she has this feeling that all these sounds. Uh, I mean, she's she's following a lot of other sounds, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, among other things, it leads her to philosophers and all sorts. Mm -hmm. uh, but but when she gets back to Thomas, she um, she she sees not the I mean the this strange feeling that the that the sounds have become you know um, some kind of waste that falls into her room. So, so in a way, sound is also. I mean, it has different meanings along the, the book. So I'm, I, I, I think there is something that is. Uh, I mean, it's, mm. it's like a prism in a way. Mm. Mm. So, um, yeah. But I also think when reading your book, it's not just hear of the, it's hearing, but it's also, yes, yeah, sensing the movement of how people move on the street. It's just mm. enhanced sensibility. 
I mean, if 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 you fall out of time, that's the great sorrow, but also the great um, gift of not being immersed in your everyday, in your life, but falling out of your life is often a stronger, a stronger sense, a stronger yeah. view of, of things. And that's what I think Tara, uh, Tara experiences. Yeah, it kind of, it's, it seems to sharpen her senses mm. at least. Yes. I mean, yeah, yeah. But, uh, but also I think uh, it's something about having, uh, not having to spend energy on all these unexpected occurrences that might be if uh, if you go even if you go down the same road the next day you know it might be very different but it's not for her so it's it's also somehow that you know there's uh, there's some energy that she can use on other mm. things and talking of uh, thinking about the future mm. maybe yeah. mm. so like can i ask you a question um often when i read I do so with a map at hand. Uh, in the old days, it would be with an atlas or with a beautiful little. <laughs> you remember the the, the red little uh, map book of Paris? Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I always kept that when reading about Paris. For <laughs> now, it's a telephone, now it's a telephone, you know, and Google Maps, etc. And I was so intrigued by the fact you said said before, Clairon sous Bois does not exist. Mm -mm. But nor do the the streets in Paris where mm. the where she where she walks, uh, the hotel she lives in does not exist, um, and 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 her friends who have the antique shop uh, is in an unexisting uh, street. So I was just wondering how much fun did you have inventing uh, streets and uh, villages and places. I mean, they kind of just came. I mean, I just thought that I just liked the like the thought of Rue Al Majeste, which is this, and it, so it just came. Okay, okay. I mean, in, in a way, sometimes it's also just you know picking up whatever comes. You know, okay. So I just had to accept. That's probably what that street is called. So, uh, but I mean, I actually thought in the beginning. I just remember many many years ago, and that was you know in the time of atlases. You know, I just found a town in northern France where I thought that this was going to take place, and uh, and then many 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 years later, I when I you know had written you know quite quite large bits. Uh, I went to that town and it simply did not work. I mean, it, it worked. I mean, if, if I looked in, at Google Maps, it, it worked too. So it was by, I mean, I had gone from the Atlas to the Google Maps, but it seemed to work. And when I was there, the atmosphere was totally wrong. Mm. So, uh, so then I had to invent the, the give the give the town a new name and find out okay what is that then so so that was I mean it was fun it, I mean a lot of these things are also kind of uh, book titles and things are kind of made up some of them too and yes some exist, yes yeah. yes and some of the uh, some of the research uh, some of the uh, there was a wonderful in book two or three a very interesting theory about the um, the, the the frontier in Europe in in the Roman uh, world and the Germanic world between rye bread and white bread and uh, very interesting stuff and I tried to find that exact uh, paper somewhere <laughs> but uh, I could find nor the paper nor the uh, nor the researcher so no, <laughs> that's no. it sorry about that yeah Rachel yeah. Uh, you chose of course uh, it's it's what you call exo fiction when you write about uh, another uh, per, an existing person uh, another person but you also had to invent uh, mm. a lot mm. so mm. Um, and and last week I talked to another Danish writer who has just written a wonderful new book about uh, um, a female uh, artist painter mm. Franziska Clausen mm. Mm. Um, and and there's a lot of these novels about painters coming out actually, mm. but yeah. um, but you know we talked a little about you know you have to do a lot of research, but then you also sort of have to to let that research go and mm. uh, put it aside and and just you know um, so so how much how, how do you forget what you have learned? Uh, how do you uh, think, sort of poor, uh, poor fantasy and not and that I not, not that I, that I am to quote a lot of uh, old uh, Greek philosophy, but in the poetics of Aristoteles, he, uh, Aristoteles, he says, Aristotle. 
Ar Aristotle, that's how you say it in English. Um, mm -hmm. He says uh, that's uh, that 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 uh, that uh, dictning. How do you say that? That poetry or writing, mm -hmm. um, fictional stuff is somehow both more philosophical and more serious than historical writing because historical writing history is about what is just there uh, the enkelt uh, uh, just the um, how do you say that in english uh, um, the contingent but that writing or the like the the, the, the creation uh, mm -hmm. poetry is about it's about what is um, what is uh, true about human life, like it, it, the 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 visa the elmin. How do you say that in English? Mm, yeah, the particular <laughs> and the, the the particular and the the the, the common in a way. Yeah. I would so say. That, yeah. yeah, yeah, you could say that that the history is about all things which are particular. That's also when you do a, like write a history or a bi biography, you would write about the pers a person's. Uh, facts about his parents and so on and so on when did you become what you became but when you write novels it's about the symbolic value what can you say about human life that pic that picture sort of takes over the other the opposite uh, drive to be true to history and then you have this sort of two two movements that are sometimes do running parallel or sometimes actually being opposite and I think uh, I'm so much of a writer that it that 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 often my my fantasy takes the control of all history, but then history sort of come back and say, "Hey, be true," and that that sort of a that is a dance. But I think that's exactly what in a historical novel creates um, a sort of um, a tenseness, which is really good. That you you can feel that the author has to work with and find out solutions how to incorporate history history while still making it more than just a particular story about a particular person but something true to life um, and I think why often artists' lives can be a bit more you know a lot of artists is my very conscious about being a character. They're already in their own way of living, sort of concentrate that sort of um, symbolic sense. So, yeah. yeah. Um, just to wrap up um, uh, this Nordic Council Prize uh, mm -hmm. has as an aim to increase awareness of um, of the of you know these neighboring countries um, each other's literature and culture increase awareness of a nordic or the nordic cultural community and and uh, you don't have to be you know to to be too long or uh, talk too much about it but i was just wondering because i'm very interested in that do you feel as part of a Nordic cultural community or a Nordic literary community or and when you go abroad you are going to Budapest tomorrow for instance uh, Rake uh, have you the experience that the people view you as Nordic or Scandinavian so just uh, Solveig first maybe um, do you feel part of the Nordic Nordic community and are you viewed as part of the Nordic community I think it is, I mean, I think that this feeling of, uh, I think, first of all, of course, yes, I mean, the answer is yes to the, to one of the questions, you know, uh, there is, I think I have a strong sense of, of, of this idea of, um, especially when I'm outside, uh, outside Scandinavia. Um, so there's a, an element of something scandinavian in you know but i i'm i'm not sure i think i, I it it depends on 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 you know um of, i mean there is an idea of course that denmark is, has is is you know has big mountains and things sometimes when you come out you know and and you know so the difference you actually get more aware of the differences that people think you are from 
you know, the northern part of Scandinavia if you're Danish. So there's a there's a, a kind of a little bit of a confusion, you know. So and uh, so in a way, I um, I think the I think. Yeah, I shouldn't make it too long, but I I feel this uh, this affinity with with uh, you know these other countries, but as as uh, as a way of having a language uh, that that keeps together some differences, and then when you go out into the world, mm -hmm. you look upon I mean as as pretty much the same, which. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a bit strange, actually. I don't yeah. know if I explain it very well. But... And, and just just to wrap it up, uh, or just to you know to 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 say that that the novel about Tara and her French village and her Parisian mm. uh, streets and and the, her travels in Europe to Germany mm. and Spain and a lot of other places, uh, UK, uh, it's a very U European uh, uh, novel. Uh, I wouldn't call it a Danish or a Nordic novel, but a very, very European uh, mm. novel. Yeah, but sometimes I have had this feeling that Tara Selsa herself is very Scandinavian. That's very <laughs> strange. I've said, gosh, Maybe. it's so straight Scandinavian in a way. Yeah. So that's weird. <laughs> yeah. And, and Rachel, to conclude, uh, mm. do you feel part of a Nordic community and are you viewed as such? Mm, it's a new thing for me that my books are getting out in other languages. Mm. So, so traveling to Budapest tomorrow will be the first ten time. Okay, that so, so so let's wait so with I that question. It. Yeah, I have it. But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I've been stud I've studied at a, a Swedish uh, school of uh, literary creation in mm. in Göteborg and have been. I I'm part uh, I'm part Finnish. Uh, and my grandparents descended from Sweden. I, I'm family with, I, yeah. So in a personal sense, it's it it it's not an opposite being being Scandinavian. And I haven't, yeah. But but in my literature yet, I haven't uh, I haven't been thinking about it as a specific Scandinavian literature. But I think people from the outside might be able to spot it. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Okay, I think I just want to thank everyone for participating. Thank you, Tor, for the wonderful moderation. Thank you, Rockel and Solvay, for uh, being here and, and sharing your work with us. Uh, thank you, audience, for tuning in. Uh, please do tune in next week on the on the fourth at the same time, one p.m. Eastern time, to hear uh, the Finnish nominee. So. Uh, Yes, uh, thank you again, and I hope to see everyone very soon. Thank you.